Uh, good evening, Moscow. Um, we're uh, Andrew McCarthy and Connor Mathern. Uh, uh, Connor Mathern here. <laughs> um, we're uh, we're the guys that put together uh, a, a moon photo that we'd love to talk about and uh, get into how moon photography works and um, why our image of the moon may look different than your image of the moon if you ever tried to capture one yourself. Um, <clears throat> so to start, um, again, my name is Andrew McCarthy and I'm a professional astrophotographer. I do this full time from my backyard. I don't do it for any uh, agency. I simply do it uh, for, for myself and for all of you. I take photos of things like nebulas, galaxies, uh, planets, our sun, and of course our moon. Uh, and, I, and I do them at a level most people didn't think was possible uh, by amateurs like myself. Um, and I can get into a little bit about how it works um, and how potentially you could do the same thing. So hello, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Connor Mathern. Uh, unlike Andrew, I don't actually do photography full time, but I am a scientist full time, right? Uh, so I used to actually work with NASA. I worked with them on the Mars Perseverance mission, uh, which is our newest rover that we sent over to Mars. Uh, I actually worked on determining the landing site for that, right? So uh, looking at where on Mars is the most ideal conditions geologically, like what would tell us the most about, you know, the red planet and its past, uh, you know, so what would be the most beneficial area to land in? Outside of uh, that, I also continue to do uh, astrophotography on the side. Uh, my main focus, though, is deep space. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, nebulas and galaxies, although I have been known on occasion to take a few photos of the moon, especially when Andrew is inspiring me to do such. Um, but outside of uh, photography, I can use those skills in my day-to-day uh, -day life, right, with the work I do. Uh, I just recently captured a photo using radio waves of the nearby Centaurus A galaxy, which is a very nearby uh, spiral gal or barred spiral galaxy over, uh, only visible from the southern hemisphere, actually. Uh, I got a photo of the black hole erupting that's only visible in radio wave, uh, but that's one of my, my newest publications. So just starting off, uh, to give you an idea of you know, what we'll be talking about, so one thing uh, that most people want to know whenever they're starting moon photography, right, or any sort of uh, astrophotography in general is, what do I need? Do I need telescope, camera? Okay, but, you know, there's got to be something more than that. Uh, so not only will we go into those very basics, but, you know, like, what is that extra step? What is that, you know, something else that you need to go from just having a telescope to taking photos, right? go into what goes into the moon photo so now that you have all your equipment what do you do with it like how do you connect things what are different pieces good for uh stuff like that uh, but then like andrew hinted at earlier on in the talk was you know what are we actually seeing right you know you go out and you look at the moon uh with your bare eyes and the what you're seeing with your eyes is whenever we uh finish our photos of it right so kind of what is that difference between what we like to portray in our photos versus, you know, what you might actually see uh, with your naked eye and why those things are different and kind of the benefits of what we're trying to show. And as you can see right there on the, the bottom right of the screen, that's actually a geologic map of the moon uh, and all the different uh, sort of things going on there from different faults to different rock groups. Uh, but then, of course, we'll have, you know, more than enough time for questions at the very end of the talk. Uh, so we use a wide variety of telescopes to capture things in our sky. Um, you know, personally, I use, uh, you know, anywhere from four to seven different telescopes on uh, an almost daily basis to capture things. Each one is very purpose built, uh, depending on what I'm trying to do. Uh, you know, for example, in these photos Connor has up here, um, the very leftmost photo and the rightmost photo, you see this big giant thing that has these struts holding together two components of the, the telescope. Uh, that's called a Dobsonian telescope. Um, and I use it mainly for visual use, but I can also do some planetary photography with it. Uh, now, when I'm capturing the moon, uh, you know, ideally I want something that's going to stay fixed on the moon. 
uh, and not uh, not allow it to drift out of frame, um, which will happen because the Earth is always moving. So I have um, what's called a, a schmidt cast grain telescope on a equatorial mount. That's what you see in that center photo there. Um, that's actually the same telescope I used to take the photo, uh, the hunt for Artemis, which um, you'll see uh, yeah, some examples of later on this slide. Um, but it's a, a very long focal length telescope, which allows me to resolve things that have a very small angular size. Now, the moon is actually uh, not small angularly relative to a lot of things in space. It's quite large. However, there's a lot of detailed features on there that I want to be able to resolve, such as mountains and craters. That's why a telescope with a long focal length uh, is required. Uh, and as an example here, I'll show you. I have one such telescope right here. This is a smaller version than the one I used for this photo. Um, but the way these work is they have a, um, what's called a corrector plate on the front holding a small mirror here. There's a large mirror in the back. And that allows the light to go down into the telescope, hit the mirror in the back, hit the secondary mirror in the front, and then go back down the back end of the tube, where it is then captured by a camera. Now, um, I, there's no eyepiece used uh, on these telescopes when I'm using them for photography. It just simply connects a camera right to the back uh, to capture the photo. Um, but you don't need such a large telescope to actually capture photos in space or even the moon. A small one like this would work just fine. Um, you know, this is a 70 millimeter aperture uh, telescope, and you can capture galaxies and nebulas with it. Not as good, though, for capturing things with a small angular size, though, like planets, or in my case, the intricate details on the moon. But it would be great for capturing the entire moon. Yeah, so... On top of uh, what Andrew was saying about telescopes, so I actually do have the the telescope with me right here that we actually used, uh, at least for my portion of the photo. This is uh, the one I use. Sadly, I don't have seven telescopes like Andrew. Uh, right now, I'm only at three, uh, which is still, honestly, too many, depending on who you ask in my family and how many times they're tired of stepping over all my equipment, right? Uh, but yeah, so, you know, you can take the lid off and kind of get a good little look inside of it at kind of what we have in there in terms of the mirror and the design for it uh but i think andrew i think you would probably agree with me on this that a lot of people when they're starting off uh i almost always recommend a dobsonian telescope to people starting off uh looking to get into either astrophotography right or to get into just using a telescope in general because the dobsonians they allow like such a good easy movement and quick setup relative to some of these more complex uh, piers and mounts and stuff for your telescope, uh, that it's really great to just kind of put the telescope down and just point it really quickly wherever you want in the sky. But because they're so large and have such high magnification, you can still get, you know, great photos of like over there on the right, you can see Jupiter on, your, you know, your laptop screen. Uh, like, even though they're, you know, more simple, they're still absolutely fantastic for astrophotography or using them visually. Uh, well, I'll disagree a little bit with the astrophotography, oh. um, okay. just because uh, somebody on a budget that wants to get a Dobsonian probably won't go for the track to option, oh, which makes true. planetary photography very difficult because yeah. you know the Earth, Earth is going to be moving and that planet will drift out of frame. So I would say, um, you know, really, really, if you want. You know, a great visual instrument, get a Dobsonian, um, and then you'll look at other options for photography. Um, yeah. Because uh, it, it would be tricky to get started with a low end Dobsonian. Uh, but some of the, you know, track Dobsonians do make for great planetary uh, instruments. Uh, and even untracked, you can do it. There's just a, a much more of a learning curve, which yeah. uh, unfortunately would be very frustrating for a beginner. Uh, to try to understand how to, you know, properly capture the planets when they're also simultaneously drifting through the frame very quickly. Uh, that, that's a really good point because we have such high magnification that, like, even, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can attest to this, that, like, even walking by a telescope whenever you're imaging, you can watch, like, the image of, you know, Jupiter, the moon, or whatever you're photographing. Uh, you can watch it shake just from the movement of you walking by, like, the subtle vibrations on the ground, right? 
Oh, yeah, I feel like an elephant because I'll walk by my telescope <laughs> and I'll see, you know, I'll have Jupiter or Saturn, you know, very close up on the screen because I'm capturing photos and it'll just do this. It'll just shake all over. I'm like, whoa, yeah. I need to go on a diet or something. But so moving on, uh, we actually have, you know, the cameras, right? So part of astrophotography is the, the camera portion. You need something to take the data of what's out in space. You need to take those photons that come hit your telescope and you need to get them uh, in viewable formats, right? Uh, so here's uh, my tried, uh, tried and true method. Uh, it's just a classic DSLR. Uh, you know, you might use just a classic lens popped on here. It's how most people are used to seeing them, right? Uh, but just like you can just, you know, pop this off and put any other lens you want here. Like here's a, a 35 millimeter uh, Sigma lens, you know, I have a 50 millimeter lens here, or I have, you know, a 600 millimeter lens here. Uh, you can take all of those lenses and use them just like, so you can use them just like you would this guy, right? So you just slot your camera right there on the very back of the telescope, just like you would any other lens, you know, they make uh, almost universal adapters to attach these guys. Uh, they're known as T-ring and T, uh, it's a T-ring and T-adapters. Uh, it's a, a standardized version uh, of a mounting system to attach cameras to telescopes that we use. Uh, it's actually a remnant from back in the day from really old film photography in the early 1900s, uh, but we still use it today for telescopes. Uh, and the reason I actually like a DSLR though is, and the reason I recommend them is because most people have one, right? Uh, if they're looking to get into astrophotography, hopefully they have some idea uh, about photography in general, right? Uh, they have that, that inherent interest in photography. So they have some camera, you know, regardless of, you know, the brand, uh, model, et cetera, uh, just a very basic DSLR works great. Uh, my first DSLR I ever used was actually a Canon T3 that my mom bought because she wanted to take pictures of us, me and my brother growing up and, you know, she just never used it. Right. Uh, so she ended up letting me borrow it. And that was, that was my first camera. You know, I've, I've moved up the ranks from there, but uh, hopefully, you know, if you don't have a DSLR in your life, at the very least, you can know someone who does have one and that would at least let you borrow it uh, to attach to a telescope you might have. Uh, but Andrew's going to talk to us about the different types of cameras other than just your classic, you know, DSLRs that are kind of a, a one in one and done sort of solution to astrophotography. Uh, yeah, well, you'll see that on the slide there, you've got a little red camera, um, and I've got one here in my hands as well. So th this is a very, very, very simple camera. Um, if you look very closely in the middle of it, you can actually see the sensor, and it's very small. It's smaller than my fingertip. Um, this is called a planetary camera, and what this does is it takes the most important parts of the camera, which is the sensor and, you know, some of the acquisition software that pulls the data off of that sensor. Um, and uh, it gets, puts a nice heat sink on the back of the sensor, and then it runs all of that data directly into a laptop PC, instead of something like on a DSLR, where you have all the onboard software right here within the camera, and then you can view your photo. Uh, it doesn't work like that. The goal behind planetary cameras is to take photos as quickly as possible. Uh, so it needs that data to just flow right into your laptop. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But um, when, I'm, when you're doing astrophotography, there's every kind of challenge in the world uh, working against you. You're dealing with things with extreme dynamic range. You're looking through miles of atmosphere and the atmosphere is incredibly turbulent. Even though you walk outside on a nice clear night and you look up, everything looks nice and clear. When you're at a very high magnification, like 7,000 millimeters of focal length, it's almost like you're looking through pavement on a hot day or you're looking into the bottom of a swimming pool. Everything is wiggling and moving. Um, and you need to be able to somehow get in between those disturbances in the atmosphere to get a nice clear photo. And one of the ways you do that uh, is by capturing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of photos using a camera specifically designed to do it. And you want to also take 
very small photos because if you're capturing a planet you don't need all the negative space around the planet you just need the the planet itself so uh you can get a small sensor which allows you to take photos even faster because those those images those individual images are so small now i can also apply that technique to the moon to create a very high resolution photo of the moon now what if I want to go even deeper than the native focal length of a telescope? I mentioned 7,000 millimeters earlier. The camera or the telescope that I use for planets and moon photography is actually only 2,800 millimeters of focal length. So I use something called a power mate. And there's, it's a variation of a Barlow uh, where it magnifies the native focal length of a telescope by adding additional optical elements. Uh, where a Barlow uses a single uh, optical element uh, Barlow uses four optical elements, which allows it not only to magnify, but to keep those uh, light rays parallel as it does so. So you get a really nice crisp image all the way to the corners of your uh, sensor on your camera. Uh, otherwise, you get something called field curvature, which really softens the image. So if you're capturing something that has a, a larger angular size than a planet, uh, it becomes out of focus in the corners. Um, so the way I capture my moon photography is through one of these uh, little red cameras that I connect to a bar low, which then connects to my telescope. And then I have uh, every, everything I need, of course, besides a computer to take my photo. Yeah, I think, Andrew, I think you actually brought up a really good point about how you take like all the good parts of a camera and kind of condense it down into the small red form factor. So like one thing I always mention about DSLRs is that like the best starting camera you can get is basically like the cheapest one you can find or one you already have, right? Because uh, like this is a, a higher end DSLR, but for astrophotography, like this has so many features in it that I will never use, right? Like it has all these like uh, facial recognition detection, stuff like that, uh, all these sort of fun automatic adjustments that it can do. Uh, but for the most part, the sensors between, you know, like your highest end ones and your lowest end ones is not not linear right like your most expensive ones are not that are you know 10 times more than your cheaper ones are not going to be 10 times better so those planetary cameras they're great at just taking everything you know that we actually want out of here and putting them in a nice small very convenient form factor uh that's actually way more budget conscious uh if someone doesn't have a, a starting camera i would always recommend just going directly to a planetary camera i think right uh, unless you want to also take photos of people and landscapes. Exactly. Yeah, that's that is true. They won't be able to. You can't bring you, that around and take portrait photos. Yeah. But you can use these for other things. You cannot yeah. use this for other things. Exactly. So it's, uh, yeah, it and really. That's why I think I, most people have one of these already. So I'm like, if you have one, just use it. But if you don't yeah. have one and you have no interest in like taking photos of your friends or whatever it may be, just skip it and go right to you know our little cameras for planetary stuff. Yeah, I love I love my DSLRs, but they're not ideal for planetary photography. Um, no, you can get some not. good you can get some good moon photos. That they'll just never be as detailed as what you can get with something like this. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So so yeah, it's it's a solid place to start. You just run into ceilings on what you can actually achieve with them mm -hmm. uh, if you're trying to go down this uh, astrophotography path. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, Andrew, do you want to actually tell them? Because I mean. You have taken way more moon photos than me. Do you want to actually tell them kind of like about like the softwares and like what makes a, a good night a good night, I guess, for taking photos of the moon? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, well, you know, first of all, I, you know, I capture my photos based on a number of factors. Sometimes I'm just simply in the mood to take a moon photo. So I just go outside oh, yeah. and do it. I just don't like really pay attention to conditions or anything. I just go outside and go, ah, oh, I'm going to take a picture of the moon tonight. That being said, I've taken a lot of duds that way. Yeah. So... What I, what I want to do is be able to assess the conditions. I use special software apps that tell me uh, the upper atmospheric conditions. In astronomy, we call them seeing conditions. And what that does is it tells us how turbulent the upper atmosphere is going to be. And if the upper atmosphere is very turbulent, usually caused by a large temperature differential between the layers of the atmosphere, uh, then unfortunately it'll be very difficult to resolve fine details. Um, now, you can overcome some of that through some of the processes and the software, but not all of it. Your best conditions will always be a more stable atmosphere, um, and you can actually tell how stable it is 
through a couple ways. First of all, you can look up and see if you're looking, see plane contrails. If you see plane contrails, that's actually a strong indicator conditions will be bad for astronomy because now you know that the, the, the conditions in the upper atmosphere are colder than conditions in the lower atmosphere. Um, something a meteorologist once told me that's that stuck with me has been very helpful the other I've thing you can know that actually andrew I, that is brand new information to even me i that's a huge help actually what's interesting is i noticed that anecdotally long before i you know i would go outside you know to, to capture the sun and i would see uh, contrails everywhere and my conditions would be terrible everything would be all wavy wow. on the screen and i would go, oh this is terrible and i never connected those dots until a meteorologist told me uh, but yeah if you see playing contrails there's a good chance that conditions will be bad uh, now, another key indicator is looking at the stars. So we all know stars twinkle, and of course planets don't, but that's a, another, uh, now planets actually do occasionally twinkle. That's a very bad day uh, for astronomy. So if you do see a planet <laughs> twinkling, that is a very bad sign. Uh, just pack up your equipment and go inside. Uh, but, uh, but if you see stars twinkling, that's normal. But how much they twinkle will actually tell you uh, the conditions of the atmosphere as well, because what causes that twinkling is the various turbulence in the atmosphere uh, folding the, the light before it gets into your eyes. Uh, and it actually, uh, it makes the star essentially invisible for a moment as it passes through these turbulent layers of the atmosphere, which is, causes it to basically flicker and, uh, in and out, uh, almost like it's vanishing from the sky for a moment. Uh, and it does that, you know, hundreds of times per second. Uh, so it just looks like a like a twinkling action uh, to our eyes. Uh, up close, it actually looks uh, you know, very interesting with a very high magnification telescope. If you can get the exposures down to actually record the twinkling, it looks fascinating uh, up close as you see the light get scattered by this atmosphere in various ways. Yeah, I couldn't um, agree more with you there. Like some of my favorite uh, views through a telescope have been on like super turbulent nights looking at uh, like Vega or some other, you know, super duper bright star uh, or Cirrus, right? Where it's just you get a rainbow of colors from the massive amount of twinkling you're getting from the turbulent atmosphere. Oh, yeah. It, it's incredible because it does scatter light differently based on mm -hmm. the wavelength of light. So you start to see all the colors of that star pop out. Uh, and they pop out in very interesting ways. Uh, but anyways, we're moving on from that. Uh, so unfortunately, it's a very uh, bad Thing for planetary and lunar photography because when you're looking at the moon up close on a turbulent day, um, you actually see it come into focus and go out of focus without touching your focus knob on your on your telescope. And that's uh, that's the atmosphere softening those layers because it changes the refractive index uh, at, a, at you know from moment to moment, and you end up with uh, you know very unfortunately unusable images. Um, it, and that's extreme high magnifications. If you're using a very simple refractor telescope, a very wide field of view, it's not as important. But I want to get as much detail as possible. I'm shooting at 7,000 millimeters, like the example on the screen here. I'm getting nice and tight up on the moon. So I need it to be as good as possible. And when it is nice and crystal clear, you still have some challenges because you're still looking through atmosphere. It's just not quite as turbulent, but it's still there. So what you do is you take thousands of photos. You don't take a few photos, you take thousands. That is why these cameras are so necessary. Because if you do that with a DSLR, you know, before you know it, you've actually worn out your, the life of your DSLR by taking so many photos. Yeah, um, even like one session of what we do with these uh, moon photographs, like that, you know, 100,000 plus photos, that would kill a, that would erode the DSLR's life by like half at a minimum. Uh, that's why these kids, they're, they're great uh, for what they do. Like they're made to take, you know, millions and millions of photos over their life. It, um, the other advantage we have here is the small sensor size. So yeah. as you can uh, see in the example photo, we have a very tight crop of the moon. Now, if I saw the whole moon with a, with a larger sensor, the same focal length, you'd think that would be better, right? Mm. But it's not. The reason for that is you need to be able to look at a small portion of the moon and reject frames that are bad. Now, just because a frame is bad here doesn't mean it would be bad on the other side of the moon. So if you're capturing the entire moon at once, you may have one corner of it that's affected by atmosphere, but not the rest of it. You would actually have to discard that entire image. When I capture them up close like this, 
I, I do discard images, but it's only one small corner of the moon. So that technique, by the way, is called lucky imaging. So I take thousands and thousands of photos and I discard the ones that look the worst. By taking the smallest field of view possible, I'm able to at the entire moon. Um, and then it's then I take those thousands of photos that I captured up these close sections and I stack together the best ones. And that does a lot for me uh, for improving the signal to noise ratio uh, of that of that image. Uh, it also, of course, allows me to sharpen it. So I end up with this very noise free, very crystal clear image by taking those thousands of photos and running them through special software. Um, I use a technique called deconvolution to resolve some details. I think we'll get into that later. I might be getting ahead of myself, nah. um, but uh, but that's only possible because I'm taking so many photos. If I take a single snapshot with a DSLR, it will be it will look out of focus mm -hmm. and it will look noisy. Yeah. Uh, and there's not really a way around that. I you know I have friends that you know, take all these photos with their DSLRs and they're like, Andrew, I don't understand. Like, why are my photos not as good as yours? And I say, sorry, you, you gotta, you need the right tools for the job and you need the right technique for the job. Um, yeah. And that, that technique is lucky imaging using a very small field of view. Um, and uh, frankly, a DSLR is not cut out for it. Yeah. In addition, in addition to um, the DSLR, uh, not being cut out for it because of the size of the sensor. It also has mechanical elements that introduce fine motion into mm -hmm. the image where this type of camera does not. Um, I, I noticed a while that my images were actually even blurrier than they should have been uh, because there was a mechanical action of the shutter opening and closing, which actually caused the entire telescope to shake. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, like, so whenever people like, whenever you take a photo of a DS, with a DSLR, most people are, are they know that like that famous uh, noise that it makes and what you're actually having happen is so there's a little mirror in here right and that mirror flips up and allows the light to hit the sensor but then that mirror closes back down and that's what's making that classic click noise uh but that motion if you're you know trying to take thousands of photos like you're just sitting there shaking that camera back and forth essentially and when you have such small changes uh they, they get magnified at these really high magnifications. And actually, Andrew, you mentioned that shooting the whole moon uh, is not good, right? Uh, one caveat there, as someone who is intrinsically lazy when it comes to their photography at times, uh, that's the only time I actually really enjoy shooting the uh, as much of the moon as possible. Because like you said, uh, how, how much time do you think you have to spend uh, making out a, a giant mosaic of, you know, your thousands and thousands of really close up shots, right? Oh, it's, it's a long time. It depends on <laughs> exactly. the focal length I do. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, it's funny. A lot of people say, you know, taking a photo of the moon is, is easy. And I say, well, yeah, like taking a, like a quick photo of the moon. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. easy, but I'm not taking quick photos of the moon. I'm taking detailed maps of the surface and the craters and the mountains. Exactly. That, that takes time. Uh, you know, I would say it's a minimum of 30 to 45 minutes of yeah. just taking photos. Uh, wow. See, and that, so for the record, Andrew's much faster at it than me. Like I'm at 30 to 45 minutes, maybe if I'm shooting like uh, 10 different panels of the moon rather than like 100 uh, different mosaic panels. Uh, he's, he's very quick at it. I've I've more experience than you with, yeah. with the moon. Just with the moon, I uh, <laughs> Uh, and yeah, but that's just, a, that's just on the acquisition side. Once I take all the photos, they all have to be stacked together. Um, they like a lot of the process is automated. I upload them in batches of like a thousand to 2000 into special software that automatically aligns sorts and stacks of photos, but then I have to piece them together manually. I just, I just do it in Photoshop where I take each tile and kind of overlay them and make sure the features line up before I, uh, bl blend them all together. Uh, which takes a lot of time to do right because you get uneven panels. The the transparency of the atmosphere is actually constantly changing. You know, you can't really see it visually, but you get like, you know, a, a little bit of precipitate or, you know, something just in between you and the, the miles of atmosphere and the moon. 
um, and it slightly changes how much of that light's getting to you. So you go to assemble this thing, and none of the panels match up. You're like, why is this one darker than this one? Uh, and that'll look terrible if you stitch them together. So you have to match the brightness of each one. So yeah, it can be quite complicated. I'm, you know, I actually with a very big moon project, sometimes it takes me weeks or even months to get a good satisfactory result because of those types of differences, which become exaggerated the more detailed the photo gets because you have mm -hmm. such a smaller field of view and use more panels to create the final image. Yeah, and I think this is, a, so this is a, some screenshots of our hunt for Artemis image, right? So you have like, I did a lot of, I did the color data for the image and Andrew did uh, essentially the detail portion of it uh, because shooting color and detail at the same time can get a little convoluted. Uh, and both of us had great, uh, views that night of the moon. So we took one at the same time and we kind of split up the load work, but you can actually, you can really see how much of a difference, you know, my 50,000 versus his 200,000, uh, how much it cleared it up, uh, over on the left. But if you look in the, the top, right, you can see, you know, a single frame versus, you know, the, the finished image, what goes from like a very blurry, very noisy image of a crater after you get rid of, you know, all the really bad atmospheric disturbance and all the noise, you end up uh, seeing way more uh, detail on the crater than what was ever there on, you know, your single photos. Uh, are uh, you are, are you sharing that image? Uh, I, I don't see it. Uh, what is showing up on my screen right now? Uh, I don't see it. Uh, you did a great oh. job describing it, but <laughs> okay, cool. Well, you know, you know the slide I'm referring. Yeah, to. Yeah, there you go. There uh, you go. All right. Right. Yeah, yeah, I just I want to make sure people can see it because this stuff is pretty cool. Right. Yeah, actually, it's, absolutely. And on the right, you can actually see, so this software, it all those squares you're seeing are actually uh, alignment points it's using, looking at, you know, features on the moon uh, to make sure that it lines up all these frames perfectly. And you can actually see a quality graph. So luckily, this isn't something, you know, Andrew and I have to sit there and, you know, go through hundreds of thousands of frames manually. Uh, this software can actually look at it and do some calculations and know just how turbulent the atmosphere was at that, you know, nanosecond the photo was taken, right? Uh, and then it can, you, know, you see the frame percentage to stack, right? So you can do like 75% if you want to keep a lot of them because you have a really good night, or you could get rid of most of them and only keep like, you know, 5%. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, generally the more frames you have, the, the better your photo is going to end up being. Uh, but the thing is, is with these photos, like, what are we seeing, right? So most people, they've seen the moon. <laughs> they walk outside, they look up in the sky, and there it is. Uh, and this is kind of what you're used to seeing. You know, you, you see a, a bright, you know, ball in the sky. Uh, it's white. It's got some stars around it, you know, maybe. Uh, or maybe it looks like this if you're super unlucky. <laughs> this is actually a photo of the eclipse in 2015. I was quite upset that I was clouded over. But, you know, this is, this is run-of-the-mill stuff with astrophotography, right? Uh, but even if you, you've had the pleasure of looking at these things through a telescope, you know, something like this might be what you're used to seeing, you know, a, a mostly uh, colorless image of the moon. Uh, but, you know, you can still see all the craters and stuff, but that leads me to, you know, so why, are, why do our photos look like this, right? And the thing with, you know, uh, science as well as just kind of, I, I think, you know, what Andrew and I like to do is what I would say is almost kind of an outreach for the sciences, Andrew, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, you know, my, my goal is just get as many people excited about space as I am. Uh, Absolutely. So I think one of the key ways of doing that is show people beautiful images. Mm -hmm. um, say, yeah. look at what's this. This is our moon. This is our moon. This is actually our moon. It looks in, in this photo like and this is a, the first time I think the complete photos popped up on the slide here. So, uh, you know, maybe first time for some of the viewers to see it. But uh, this is a th this is the final product of our collaboration, you know, a combination yeah. of 250,000 photos with um, where you can actually see the real color of the moon, something that your eyes actually can't see or and our eyes are, you know, of course, limited the, the yeah. camera um, and the cameras are less limited. <laughs> Yeah, um, and that's the thing. So, like, the cameras, like, they're amazing tools, right? And they can do so much more that our eyes can't. But the thing is, is, like, when we look up in the sky, you know, and we see half of the moon, right? We know there's another portion of the moon there. Our eyes just can't see it because it's too dark, right? There's no sunlight, or there is some sunlight because we can see it in the photos, but there isn't enough for our eyes to actually see it, right? kind of like th these color differences, like, all these color differences are really there. And they actually tell quite a story that, you know, I'll get into in a bit. Uh, but like, our eyes are limited, you know, they're not 
perfect tools for a job, you know, like if we, and the science has relied solely on our eyes for, you know, scientific advancement, we lose out on, you know, almost every discovery made in the 20th century, right? Uh, which we, we shouldn't limit ourselves to just what our eye can see. But also at the same time, uh, I think this gives a more accurate, you know, representation of like what the moon actually is, right? Versus what our eyes can see. Because, you know, the moon is a full sphere. It does have these real subtle color differences on it. Uh, and just because we can't see it doesn't mean, you know, the way I look at it is they shouldn't be portrayed, right? I'm, I'm sorry, what was your question? <laughs> sorry, I, I was saying that, like, you know, I think these kind of photos that we've made of the moon are better representations of the, the moon because, like, what we see with our eyes are, you know, what we're limited to. But we know the moon is a full sphere, not just, like, a half right. slice cut in half, yep. right? We know that there are these, you know, different geologic conditions on the moon, even if we can't see them with our eyes. Like, we know they're there. Uh, and highlighting things like that, I think, is really important for giving a more complete photo of the moon uh, relative to what we're actually can just, you know, capable of looking up in the sky and seeing. I, I try to remind people that our eyes are actually a pretty poor instrument for yeah. measuring reality. We measure a very limited slice of reality with our eyes. Um, and it's very important, you know, but it does not tell a complete picture. Um, yeah. You know, our, our moon has all kinds of variation to landscape that your eyes cannot detect. And, and to your point, Connor, you can't see the dark side of the moon most of the time. Yeah. And because something is, sha is in shadow, uh, we, we all have, uh, we all understand object permanence, you know, exactly. it's like, not like the game of peekaboo your parents played with you when you were a baby. Uh, we know when something disappears, it doesn't mean it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, it just means our eyes no longer detect it. Uh, so how do we incorporate these things into photos uh, so that we can show what is really there, even though your eyes can't see it. Um, you know, much of my work is about showing people uh, beyond the limits of your eyeballs um, to you know, you know, show yeah. you all the beautiful things that are out there that you might be missing. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite examples is actually that I use all the time is like, say, and it's on my bed, but I go into my room and I shut the lights off. Like, not only is that blanket still there, it's not you know black it's not nothing uh but it, it's it's still blue even if my eyes aren't capable of currently seeing it and you know it's not just us that do this right like uh this is a photo from the galileo missions uh from nasa in 1996 and this is you know the photo that uh, galileo took of the moon uh but then it also took this right and what we're seeing here is that infrared data you know things that our eyes can't see uh what this actually is showing us is the atomic bonds between different elements on the lunar surface, right? So you might have a carbon and a hydrogen bonding, and we have very specific emissions of that uh, wavelength that are known, or, you know, maybe it's a, a sulfur, or maybe it's, uh, you know, some uh, carbaceous mineral, or it's just some variation of basalt. Like, there's way more variation on the actual surface of the moon. Like, it looks, for the most part, homogeneous when we look at it, but geologically speaking, the composition of what rocks actually make up the moon, you know, couldn't be more different. Uh, but we do see like, uh, so here's an example of, uh, there we go. So this is an example actually of what it kind of looks like when you're looking through the telescope at the moon. And we can see a lot of that uh, wavy, you know, kind of under the water effect that Andrew was referring to earlier. You can see it kind of going in and out of focus. Uh, but one of the big things about the moon, right, is we have such a, a drastic change in dynamic range and this was also something andrew mentioned earlier you know when the sky is basically pitch black the moon is very very bright and seeing those subtle differences on the actual lunar surface is really tough especially from a color perspective uh and but just because those differences aren't there uh with our eyes doesn't mean they're not actually there and visible to more precise instruments like our cameras so here we have two squares one that looks whitish and one that looks grayish uh, but if we increase the saturation on these images, we can actually see they are yellow and blue, two drastically different colors. Uh, and this is actually a, a great example. This is from the Apollo missions. Harrison Schmidt, one of the only geologists to actually ever get sent to the moon. Uh, and as a geologist, I've always loved that. But here we have a photo he took of he's on the radio and he's, you know, exclaiming there's orange soil, there's orange soil here. And you look at that and it's not really orange. 
Uh, but this is all to do with, you know, film development, right? So once he was back on Earth, he actually talked uh, to the people who developed this photo and they recreated it. And this is more like what he was actually seeing. Uh, so even, you know, people like NASA, when they're trying to make their photos look just like what the person was actually seeing, uh, they can get it wrong, right? So here's actually another great example. So this is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's a, a satellite that orbits the moon and takes photos. Like this is purely in the visible spectra. But as you can see, there's a lot of oranges, browns, and blues, very bright whites, and very dark regions of the moon. Uh, these are all different mineralogical compositions. These are all uh, variations that, you know, with the moon being so far away and so bright, they're just very tough to see from here on Earth. But, you know, all these things are really there. You just need to have better equipment than just our, you know, silly little eyes to spot these differences. Uh, but with that said, uh, I, of course, want to thank you all very much for your time. Uh, I know it's quite late over there in Moscow. Uh, just so happy that you all could join us, especially a lot of our American viewers as well. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I can't wait to hear some questions from you all. Uh, Andrew, any closing thoughts? Uh, no, just wanted to say thank you to the American Center in Moscow, and uh, yeah, thanks thanks for letting us ramble. Uh, we hope that uh, you know we've inspired some of you maybe to look at the moon maybe a little bit differently, uh, and maybe even some of you to pick up a camera and I try to take some photos. Um, you know, we're very I think both Connor and I are very accessible when it comes to answering questions. Not only of course in the chat, but even you know finding us on social media and reaching out to us. I think he had our handles up there for like just a second. I think those oh, are yeah. Instagram, our Sorry. Instagram handles um you know we we love talking to people um and no worries i know like this is getting translated and um in into russian so we can use translators and answer questions ourselves too so it's like don't yeah. worry about the the language barrier we are happy to chat with anybody who wants to get into this of i think course, space yeah. is one of the things that unites us and i think andrew you're right with me like if, if i get a message on instagram I'm almost always responding to it. Uh, I, I hate the idea of unread emails. I'm one of those people that always reads every email uh, that I get uh, just to just make that number go down. But at the same time, I'm always just so excited to help anyone looking to get in the space. But I'll actually uh, do the first question for you, Andrew. So this is uh, what initially sparked your interest in astrophotography? And was there a specific space photo you saw when you were younger that inspired you to try yourself? Uh, well, what I what first sparked my interest in astrophotography was actually um way back you know going back to uh when i was a little kid i think i was like eight years old and my dad showed me jupiter and saturn through his yeah. telescope um and seeing those as a kid you know set you know sparked all kinds of curiosity probably had no real good frame of reference what i was looking at but um you know that turned me you know probably what what in, turned me into a star trek junkie you know mm. i was like watching star trek and just like loved it watched star wars loved it you know it was like all of my legos were like space based uh so you know i was very much like you know i was just kind of in that trajectory ever since i was a little mm -hmm. kid and then when i was in a an adult uh i bought a telescope on a whim to try to recreate that experience for me um, and, you know, of course, try to take a photo using my cell phone through the oh, IP. Yeah. Uh, didn't turn out too, too well, but that was what got me on this trajectory of astrophotography. And that was only, uh, that happened about six years ago, I mean, five, six years ago. Uh, so it wasn't that long ago, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. And then now this is where, where I am and what I'm doing. So, um, you know, I think that that trajectory could apply to almost anybody. Yeah, and actually, I'm not too far different from you. So, like, for me, what sparked my initial interest in space was, like, seeing those images from Hubble of, like, the Pillars of Creation or, like, uh, the Helix Nebula, right? Like, those are two, like, of my favorite all-time photos. Uh, and I saw those, you know, when I was a kid. Like, they'd always get tossed around in, like, the email chains and stuff like that. Uh, but then a step beyond that, uh, I was in college, and that was when I found out that not only are, you know, like NASA and Hubble capable of this, but like civilians essentially are capable of this. And I took my brother's telescope who, you know, he had gotten one when he was a kid and he had never touched it since. I plopped it down and pointed at the first bright thing I saw in the sky. And it just happened to be Jupiter. And I nailed it when I looked through the eyepiece, which knowing today, like how many times have you randomly pointed at something in the sky, Andrew, and gotten it like right there when you look? Because I can, I almost yeah. miss the moon sometimes. <laughs> If I knew how lucky I was, I yeah, I more than likely, I think that was that was an act of faith right there. 
Uh, yeah. But of course, I did the same thing. I'm sitting there holding, you know, my camera up to the eyepiece, trying to get it in focus. And I was like, there's got to be a better way than this. No one uses a cell phone for this. And that's what, you know, brought me into the hooking up cameras uh, to actual telescopes. Yeah, it sounds like both of our stories are a little serendipitous. I, uh, yeah. you know, if, they, if, if Jupiter wasn't out that night, would we both be on the careers that we have and you know, have gotten into astrophotography? Who knows? Honestly, probably not. <laughs> like, <laughs> actually, yeah, now that I think about it, imagine if we didn't have many other planets in the solar system to, like, actively view if there would still even be that interest. But, Andrew, we, we talk things like this all the time, right? We're always going off on tangents. Uh, oh, but okay. next question. <laughs> Uh, what advice would you give to photographers eager to capture detailed lunar images but might not have advanced equipment? Uh, you know, phones are getting very advanced these days. Yeah. Start with your phone. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, your photos aren't going to be as good as mine, but that's okay. You're dealing with yeah. limited technology. Um, and then, you know, a small, like, desktop uh, Dobsonian, they're actually pretty cheap. I think you can get one for, like, 50, 60 bucks. Yeah. Um, that's, that's USD. Um, but you can take those, point them at the moon, and put your camera on the uh, against the eyepiece, and actually take a decent moon photo. Um, and you know, there's a lot of people I know that do just that, um, and they actually capture really cool photos. And they do different things with layering and compositing, take photos of the moon against the clouds and the stars. Um, mm -hmm. So if you if you combine uh, you know some good like uh, curiosity with some diligence and a little bit of work with learning the software and learning how to control the exposures on your camera you can actually get some really really nice photos don't yeah. expect it to compete with mine but we're not in competition with each other yeah. just so long as you like it that's the important thing you know it's, it's actually funny when i first met andrew uh i early on when i was doing astrophotography it was always a strive to like i need to make my images better than x persons uh but after actually talking to people within the community that that went right out the window right like i ended up like i realized just how much more fun it is to collaborate with other people right it's not a competition and that's one thing i always try to stress to people looking at astrophotography uh like you see a lot of our finished works like I've, I've been doing this for almost 10 years now uh andrew's been doing this for nearly the same amount of time like our first photos i, I wish i would have included one uh my first photo <laughs> is like a seven pixel wide image of saturn and it <laughs> really even make out the rings it looks like an oval like we all start somewhere and honestly people that start today are gonna have way better results than we even did too because you know at least they have their nicer cell phones uh because when i i recommend to people uh deep space photography stuff a lot right i'm sure you get all the beginning moon questions but i get all the beginning you know nebulas and galaxy questions i always just recommend that people just get a cheap dslr throw it on top of a rock and just let the camera roll right uh but even nowadays like I was like, oh, that's the, the entry level. But nowadays I'm even, you know, a step further back than that. I'm like, you have a cell phone and they have night modes on them. Like, start off with that. Uh, but uh, my next question for you, Andrew, uh, did you expect our photo of the moon to be this well received? Uh, I, I didn't. Um, I think one nice thing about this photo, the hunt for Artemis, was that it, um, it told a very nice story yeah. about two complementary minds coming together to create something incredible um you know it's like i've taken obviously tons of photos of the moon some of them are very popular and some of them just aren't and i don't think that's necessarily quite like a testament to the quality of the photo so much as um how well the story resonates with people and i think one of the interesting things about the hunt for artemis is because of our story because it was two different minds coming together you know one i think i think you're a little bit more scientifically mind minded connor and i think i might be more artistically minded mm -hmm. because of that the nature of that collaboration we were able to show people the moon in a new way and either of us could have done that alone as well i think i think you're just as artistic as i am honestly if not more yeah, so but, i uh, i disagree <laughs> i think you're far better than me the, the things you uh, have pulled off i'm like andrew <laughs> has such a creative mind uh that like i like i can like peek outside of the box dude you're over there living in your own box completely separate from me you you've left the box and built your own it, it blows me away just how creative you can be at times yeah i'm uh, in the garbage bag next to the <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of the same about uh like about it being well received uh i you know some of my favorite images i'm sure you can attest to this too like some of my personal favorite images no one cares about 
uh, but you know, some of the ones where I'm like, ah, eh, it's an okay photo. Like sometimes what, you know, people are after, uh, but this one, uh, I, I did really like the fact that, you know, my favorite part of it is getting people excited about space. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's great to have this collaboration of showing that not only is it possible to kind of do this, but like, there's a whole community of us that do this essentially. Right. Uh, but I'll let you take this next question. Uh, all right, so um, let me think. It was, uh, in your opinion, how important is post-processing in astrophotography? Mm -hmm. What photo editing programs do you use to produce the best image possible? So yeah, I think I think it's, it's half the battle is what I would say. Uh, that's generally how I describe it. Uh, personally for me, since I am more uh, galaxy and nebula deep space oriented, I use software called PixInsight. Uh, it's my favorite, uh, pretty much everything I do is through that and actually a lot of the scientific photos i've created i've used that same exact software because it's a very mathematical and scientific software uh like background so a lot like you can't just you know paint in things like i get a lot of questions about that like oh are you just painting in things you're just painting in colors it's like no like all these things are really there in the data and that software is almost frustratingly limiting sometimes in terms of like what it'll actually allow you to do but on the back end from like a uh how scientifically sound something is i can always like look back and see what kind of formulas i'm running and whatnot um uh, but that's what i use and what do you use uh i i use the same thing but i use uh photoshop as well not to uh like you know people say people associate photoshop with like yeah. artificial images now exactly which i think very bad because it's the most powerful photographer's tool exactly. um and one thing about post-processing i think that people forget is uh your phone actually does mm -hmm. all kinds of process to your images they're just pre-baked yeah. they're just a pre formula color balancing uh sharpening noise reduction it goes through all of these steps uh yeah. it, right when you take a photo and then you see the final photo and you're like oh yeah that looks good um you, if we did something similar to that or the photo would look bad because oh, yeah. a pre a pre-baked setting like that is not going to apply very well when you're shooting something that's so faint it's basically invisible. Uh, so we need to be very mathematical and very accurate with how we process the images. So in many ways, our photos, while yes, they're post-processed, um, they're much more accurate than what yeah. you would take with a cell phone. Um, and the post-processing isn't really editing as much as it is like developing the photo, developing. like in a digital, a like in a digital dark room. Um, and uh, you know, when you change that mindset, it helps you, I think, understand where these photos come from, uh, because th these cameras actually, they don't pr do any kind of processing. It just sends the raw data directly yeah. into your computer. Um, so it has to be post-processed. The and raw data doesn't look good. <laughs> I think what's important is that, you know, you and I both, we're never trying to make, you know, like really artificial scenes or like add things that aren't there right like we're not adding you know saturn's rings to the moon really like i mean if we, do, we, we would clearly state hey uh, these are saturn's rings on the moon right yeah. but like we, we do our best to kind of portray the scene as best as we can and and accurately at that right well also still you know taking some artistic liberties just to make it visually appealing uh because you know it is part of it is you know getting people excited about space and that, that's a whole thing but the the actual act is you know i think you and i both have at least you know a, a huge portion of scientific like integrity behind our images right uh, like i i couldn't imagine like faking photos or whatever uh like that would, that would kill me <laughs> personally uh but do you have any memorable experiences or adventures you've had while capturing astrophotography you know i I, I think I would say that my most memorable experiences are always the celestial events that I'm capturing. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, anything random happens. It's not like I'm a, you know, I'm a wedding photographer or something yeah. like that, where it's like there's this human element of surprise mm -hmm. where, oh, no, the bride ran out. You know, yeah. it's it, it's like nothing like that, I think, would happen. Yeah. That's not really predictable um, with some caveats to that. But um, I, I, I would say the weather is the only thing that's like a little bit variable. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. You know, I think I think one of the nice, the nicest, pleasant surprises I've had is when I'm shooting a celestial event, uh, such as a lunar eclipse or mm -hmm. maybe a Martian occult to the moon, and the clouds roll in, 
not oh, to obscure, but to but frame highlight. the image. Yeah. And then I end up with a photo with a little bit of earthly drama around it that yeah. was not planned. Uh, that ends up adding, I think, a little bit more character to my image, but also makes it completely unique than any other photo capture of the exact celestial event because nobody had the clouds in exactly the same way I did. Yeah. Um, so I think little surprises like that are what I, what I love seeing as a astrophotographer. Even though I hate clouds, when they come in just right, oh, sometimes, yeah. it, sometimes it improves the image. See, and I, I think for me, uh, like, the the biggest like i always tell people that astrophotography is like you have one model and you get a hundred photographers lined up to take a photo of that exact model with the same lighting and everything else because we're all taking photos of the same thing it's like how do you make your photo different from like that hundred those hundreds of other photographers right like there is some technique in it but there's also the processing uh so things like the clouds are great but for me my most memorable events are always uh when i bring other people with me right so uh my favorite is uh, so I'm a geologist. So I did uh, what's called field camp, which is essentially me and a bunch of other geologists in college. We get shipped off to the middle of nowhere and go wander around and look at rocks for a couple months. Uh, we had one night off a week and I had five me who had never seen the Milky Way before. And on our one night off, there was no moon and it was clear, which is like one night out of the week like that was... A, a great kind of alignment of the stars, uh, pun intended. Uh, but we all went out there and I got to show five people the Milky Way that had never seen the Milky Way, right? I got to show them the, the different parts of it and they had seen the sky as they never had before. Uh, and to this day, they always, they mention like going out and seeing it again or uh, the times they've gone out and done, you know, stargazing on their own. Like they had never done that before, but because they had such a great experience, like I've influenced them to the point where they go out and do it on their own now. And for me, I love that because that's a, a lasting impact. That's great. Inspiring people. It's just like, it's, it's what the better purpose. Thing. What better purpose than that? Yeah. No? I think we got one more here. So astrophotography requires patience and dedication. How do you maintain your enthusiasm and commitment over long hours of capturing and processing images? That's a good one. Uh, so I, I like to tell people, uh, you know, frequently that I am actually not special in any way whatsoever. Uh, you know, they say, oh, you, you, know, you must take talent to do this. Um, so that is actually not true. You don't need talent to do, I think, most of anything. Yeah. What you need is to love it enough to get through it when it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, you know, you ask a, a musician, they didn't pick up the guitar and like learn to play it instantly and were good mm -hmm. at it. No, they just loved it enough to play it long enough while they were terrible at it uh, to where they suddenly yeah. started becoming good. Uh, so I think the, the, the reason I have enthusiasm over this is because I love it enough to be enthusiastic, even though it's difficult. Yeah. Um, if you don't love it enough, then you probably will not be as successful because you won't have this level of enthusiasm doing something that's repetitive and difficult and oftentimes not very rewarding. Yeah. Um, however, when the payoff is good, it's worth it. So I urge anybody to try to stick with it as long as they can, even when it's very frustrating. The amount of times I've cursed at my telescopes, <laughs> we won't get too many, it, but <laughs> yeah. too many times. Yeah, yeah. right there with you. Like the amount of times I've uh, <laughs> stayed up all night and I, I check my phone and it says like 535 a.m. And my alarm is slated to go off in 25 minutes. And I look at my laptop and there's zero photos to show for the entire night of like troubleshooting. Like those don't really translate into our final photos right but those all exist you know i'm sure like you know learning guitar or whatever there's you know hours where they spend like trying to learn riffs or whatever but it, it's that dedication and passion that you know even though i was up all night doing that uh, like that is kind of the love for astronomy that just drives me that's like okay well you know tonight was rough but you know, it'll get better like there's always bad nights right it's just like anything else and honestly even when I am frustrated, at least I still had a good time, you know, looking at the stars or whatever it may be. Uh, but just some like final thoughts. I mean, I hope like even if no one goes out and does astrophotography after hearing us talk about it, right? Like I don't expect, you know, everyone watching this to go out and buy a telescope and camera and set it up. But for me, like I think just small victories are just like if someone goes out and just looks at the stars one more time uh, for me, that's a win. That's all I ever ask for. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, take, you know, take a moment and just appreciate our place in the universe and, you know, spend some time looking up, looking for the moon, uh, you know, as it rises when it's full, you know, just take a moment and just appreciate there's, you know, everybody's looking at that same moon. It's it's one of the few things that I think we all have in common is we all share the same sky. Um, so, look, like... Oh, I love I love space. I hope you love yeah. it too. Some people are made to be capturing photos, and some people are meant to just be looking at those photos. Uh, so it's okay if it's not for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but our sky is for everybody, and That's just the true. way you appreciate it is a very personal thing to you. So go appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. Andrew, and thank you thank to you, our, our audience. Like this, this has been great. Uh, what an experience. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the American Center in Moscow again, and thank you for the audience. Thank you for listening to us. I know, either if it's late at night. Yeah. <laughs>